All right, now we are gonna get into the dichotomous key. The dichotomous key is a method that we use to identify organism based on their physical, unchanging characteristics. Now, if you have used a dichotomous key before or you've seen it in another class, this is pretty straightforward because you're used to it. If you haven't though, it can be very, very confusing. So if you know how to use a dichotomous key, go ahead and skip to the next lesson. You can just jump right into figuring out how to ID your basic specimens. If you don't know how to use one, Stay with me here because I'm going to teach you how to use the dichotomous key using physical unchanging characteristics, but in something you're a little more familiar with. I'm going to use shoes. All right, so this might seem a little strange, but this is my absolute favorite way of teaching how to use the dichotomous key. This is because all we are doing with identifying organisms like insects is taking their physical outward appearance, their physical unchanging characteristics, and grouping them together with other organisms that have those same characteristics. The beauty of a dichotomous key is you can use it to organize literally anything out there as long as you can group these things based on their physical unchanging characteristics. So what I have for you here is a sampling of a bunch of different types of shoes. I'm going to go through the process that we use as entomologists to create dichotomous keys for insects, except using something you're a little bit more familiar with. So as I'm going through this, think about this is literally what we do in the lab. We get a whole bunch of insects that maybe we haven't seen before, that we think are grouped together, or maybe they're just a bunch of bugs from Texas or from the US or even from the world. And we start grouping them together with these physical unchanging characteristics, and then we write it down. So take a look at all of these shoes I have uh, shown for you here. I've got all manner of different types. We've got high heels and low heels and sports shoes, some that are super cute, some that aren't, etc. Okay, now imagine trying to quote unquote identify an entirely different type of shoe that isn't represented here. Maybe like one of those crazy sandals or those weird finger shoes or things like that you would not be able to do it. This is because we have to make sure we are identifying the organism or the shoe in this case that has come from the exact same population. So now the way that I start this out is I have to look at what things are in common among this group. So think about it in your head really fast. What do I have in common here? Well, if we look at some of these, we can see that some of them have, say, high heels and some of them do not, right? So let's start grouping them all together. I'm gonna put all of the heels together over here. Now at this point, I do have to define a few things, don't I? Because when I say heels, if you say look at those brown shoes right here, that does have sort of a heel. So what do I mean by heel? Let's say I define a heel as anything over than an inch. Okay, so anything over an inch is considered a high heel. Anything under an inch is considered a low heel. So let's start dealing with these high heels, everything over a one inch thing over there. Now I could break these up differently. What if I decided to break them up by buckles? Let's say we put all the things with buckles or bows on the toe, or maybe they are some with straps and some without. So it's just all about how we are making decisions on grouping these things together. Think about how we do this with insects, right? You could take a large group of insects and try to group them together. The ones with wings, the one without wings, maybe different organisms with different number of body parts, a head, thorax, abdomen versus a cephalothorax and an abdomen, you know, like we do as we learned in lecture. Okay, now back to the shoes. Then we can take these smaller groups and try to group them. So here, let's say we're grouping them. These are open-toed versus closed-toed. That's pretty straightforward. Or maybe we could do the size of the ankle, really high versus low. But again, we'll have to define that. What does quote unquote high mean? You always want to define these qualifying types of things because it can be confusing from person to person. So we can just play around with this and different people doing these keys are going to do them slightly differently. This is why we tend to see different keys looking a little bit different. Okay, 
Now let's go uh, the open toe versus closed toe. That seems like a good way to do this. So what I need to do now is I need to communicate to the people reading this exactly the decisions that I am making and how to break up these groups, right? So I decided open toe versus closed toe. And I can do this by presenting this visually in something that we call a cladogram. So a cladogram is simply a line drawing that we label with our decisions. So let's start at the top here. I'm going to start with this shoes. Good way to start it, right? We're just choosing all the shoes. So this makes it different from shorts or hats or whatever else. And then I have two choices, one line going to the right, one going to the left. Okay, now I need to write down a very simple statement stating out my decision. So in this case, you would go to the right if you have a shoe that has a heel above one inch. And then you would go to the left if you have a heel under one inch. So that's pretty straightforward again, right? So it's very, very uh, simple. It is uh, obvious. It's, it's quantifiable instead of qualifying. Okay, so nobody has any questions there. Now let's break up the uh, high heeled shoes here. Okay, so another line goes down saying, okay, here's another decision point. Go to the right if it goes one way, go to the left if it goes another. Okay, now, I just need to label again. So we decided open toe versus closed toe, right? So again, it is just simply letting the reader know the decision we made on how to break up these two groups. Let me just switch this really quick, just for room's sake on here. So if you have a shoe with an open toe, you're gonna go to the left and that's gonna bring you to this one quote unquote species of shoe. And then if you have a closed toe, you're gonna go to the right. Now we have this even smaller group that we break up. So we can break this up in a variety of ways, but let's say, oh, buckle versus no buckle, right? We've got a couple of shoes there with buckles, one shoe without buckles. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. Very easy to define again. We know what a buckle is. Great. Now, if you didn't know what a buckle was, you could go look it up and say, I don't know, a glossary. Huh. And then you'd know exactly what it was. So this is a physical characteristic. This is a bit of anatomy on this shoe, so to speak. So let's move the no buckle shoe over here. Okay, make things fit a little bit. Now notice how much room this is taking. This can take a lot of room with all these pictures and things like that. That's a lot of pages to print and that becomes an issue. So keep that in mind for a minute when I talk about how we uh, shorten this. A bunch. Okay, now we're down to our final two shoes on this uh, one inch heel or above one inch heel. One more decision needs to be made until we've gotten everything. What's the easiest thing on this one? Yep, the ankle height. I mean, that's pretty high versus low. So you got the ankle below one inch and ankle above one inch. Pretty straightforward. And again, notice instead of saying high or low, I'm defining it in numbers. I'm quantifying it as much as possible. You're going to see this example over and over and over again. Now let's pause all this narration just really quickly so we can run through what I did there. Now let's say I've got an unknown shoe. What I can do is I can start at the top like, yep, it's a shoe. I've defined it as a shoe. And then I can just simply follow this all the way down, right? So does it have a heel or doesn't it? Or is that heel above one inch or isn't it? Okay, it's above one inch. I can go to the right. Does it open toe or closed toe? If it's open toe, I get down to this cute little uh, red and white shoe here, species, so to speak. If it's closed toe, I go the other way. Then I have to look, does it have a buckle or no buckle? Is the ankle above one inch or below one inch? And that gives me down to these individual shoe types. All right, now let's do the same thing on these other groups of shoes. So let's see, how do we want to break up these low heeled shoes here? Hmm, we've got some with laces, some without laces. Uh, we've got some that are more formal versus not more formal, but you always want to think about how are we going to define this? So I think laces are probably going to be the easiest way to do this. Yeah. Okay. So we got this one biking shoe without laces that just straight up Velcro one, one with, so no laces versus laces. But again, look how much room I need in order to do all of this with these pictures. This can take a lot of space, but let's keep going. 
Okay, so we got our no laces here. So that's gotten down to that one biking shoes species, so to speak. So that's good. Now, how are we gonna break up these laces shoes? This is getting a little interesting now. Okay, so how are we gonna break these up? There's a bunch of different ways, but what looks like the easiest is looking at the comparison between the heel and the toe height. If you look at two of these shoes, the heel and the toe height are very different. So the heel is a little higher, while the toe height uh, and the heel is the same for that converse pair. So let's do that. Okay, so. We're gonna look at the uh, ratio basically between the heel and the toe height. So in one case, the heel and the toe are equal in height, while in the other, the heel is a little bit higher than the toe. So let's put that there. Ratios are really, really common in dichotomous keys. Okay, so we got heel and toe height equal, heel and toe height a little bit different over here. All right. So now we're looking at then how to break up these two very similar shoes. They're both formal. So let's see, if we look at the number of eyelets here, physical unchanging, what, there's five, one, two, three, or five on this one, and there's only three on this pair. So that's a pretty good characteristic. Very different, really obvious to see, very simple to uh, communicate. So let's break this up by eyelet number. Okay, one more decision tree. This side and this side. Da -da -da. Got three eyelets on this side and five eyelets on this side. So type that out really quick. All right. You can see that three there and five on this other side. Great. Okay, so. After I finish this then, now we have a full tree, don't we? We have this cladogram where I'm able to compare and contrast all these different shoes that were just in a jumble beforehand, and now we can figure out the quote unquote species of a shoe. So then how does this work? Let's say I have this unknown shoe up here. I can use this to make decisions. So it's owns to shoe. Let's look at it. The heel's under one inch, so I go to the left. Okay, does it have laces or no laces? I see it's got laces. Great, now the heel and toe are equal. Dun, 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 dun. I'm down to my red converse, done. So that is how we make a key. Now, this is the exact same process that we use for insects, is we just simply break them up like this. But of course, you've noticed that the keys that you have in your lab manual and that you're seeing online a lot, they don't look like this cladogram, do they? Instead, they are simply what we call couplets. So all we have to do in order to make these couplets is to take those exact same decisions and instead of putting them in the cladogram, let's write them out just like this. So here is our very first uh, decision or our very first uh, decision in the couplet, right? It goes heel under one inch, if it is, you go to number two. Heel uh, above one inch, you go to number five. Okay, so then what is the next decision? For heels under one inch, we got laces versus no laces. Okay, so number two then is laces versus no laces. So then we type that out, laces versus no laces. So if you have laces, you go to couplet number three. No laces, you go to couplet number four. All right, so. Number three then, no laces, that's gonna be this species of shoe, whatever we're deciding to name that species of shoe, so to speak. So instead of going to another thing, let's just name it, right? So no laces, that's, you're gonna get to cleats. That's the name of the shoe now, okay. So you can name this whatever, great. So you'll see on your dichotomous key with all these insects, sometimes at the end of a couplet right there, I will have the species name or an order or a family or whatever. Okay, now on to number three, which is that next decision tree, heel and toe different sizes, heel and toe equal. So again, we are, uh, uh, there's only one left there, it's that red converse. So now we're down to the species of shoe again. Okay, so what do we got here? So yeah, Chuck Taylors, check. Now, number four, we've got those, the aqua and the brown dress shoes, three eyelets versus five eyelets. So if it's got three eyelets, it'll be, oh, whatever we want to call it. 
and if it's five eyelets, whatever we want to call it. Let's see, yeah, yeah, polka dots, sure. And five eyelets, those brown shoes. And there we go. Now those are the name of our shoes, okay? Now see how that works? Now instead of having to actually use that visual thing, you can just read the couplets. Just go back and forth here. Now, we want to make sure we include every single shoe and shoe type. So let's go the other way. So now, if it's above one inch, now we're going down that other side of that cladogram. Remember we did open toe versus closed toe. So open toe was that cute little heart shoe. Yep, adorable. Closed toe were those other three super cute shoes. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna go to number six. So then number six, remember it was buckles versus no buckles. Typing and speaking is hard. And the buckle was another uh, uh, group of shoes. The no buckle were those super pink sparkly ones. Ah, uh, this pink stripper shoes, yeah. <laughs> Finally, the last two, we broke them up by the ankle being above one inch and the ankle being below one inch. Okay, so the ankle above one inch, that was the, the big tall boots. And the ankle below one inch were those red polka dots. So now we have our key once we finish this out. So we have taken that cladogram that we have right here and we've condensed it into a single page that makes it very easy to go through. So then this is the type of key that you're seeing all the time, right? Just simple couplets that tell you which next couplet to go to. This is literally what we do in the lab. We take those insects and we break them up by their physical unchanging characteristics. Now we can do this with literally everything and we have. So let's start here. And we'll do this one more time with fantastical creatures instead of shoes. So here we've got, oh, Sasquatch and Frankenstein's monster and Dracula and some sort of ghosty thing up there and, oh, a, uh, a werewolf. So we can break these things up again based on their physical unchanging characteristics. Let's see, we can break them up by, oh, let's see, the group that has excessive body hair, okay, external body hair. So we've got the werewolf and Sasquatch that have excessive external body hair while these other three do not. So that's a pretty good characteristic, right? We can also break it up in other ways. We can say, oh, undead versus fully alive. But think about if you only had a dead specimen of these things. You have no idea which one's undead or which one's fully alive, right? You'll see some keys that do mention those sorts of things like found in this area, but it's not as useful if you only have dead specimens. Could also be, oh, these uh, walk on legs versus not, or these uh, stand upright versus on all fours. It's really whatever you think is going to work. Okay, so let's break it up. I like the uh, hair versus uh, no hair. That makes it pretty simple, very easy to see, physical on the outside, dead or living specimens. So again, we start with our cladogram. We do uh, the simple choice left and right, excessive body hair, no excessive body hair. So on one side, we've got Sasquatch and a werewolf. Other side, we do not. It has fur, does not have fur. Great. Okay. Now, how are we going to break up Sasquatch and a werewolf? So there's a lot of ways we can do that. Uh, let's see. Sasquatch has two legs while the werewolf tends to have four. Or maybe the Sasquatch has got normal human -y teeth, I'm assuming. And while uh, the werewolf has like crazy canines. Or Sasquatch has got nails while the uh, werewolf has got retractable claws. Let's do that one. That one's easy to see, right? So let's do normal nails, or as normal as we can assume they are, given nobody's ever found Sasquatch. And retractable claws that we find in werewolves. Okay. Again, very easy to see, even in dead specimens. Easy to make that decision. So, writing out on our cladogram, claws versus nails or human-like features. Okay, so now we're able to get down to there. Now on to these other, uh, this other group. 
Okay, now on to breaking up these other fantastical creatures. How can we break this group up? Well, let's see. Frankenstein's monster and Dracula here have a physical body, while this ghost poltergeist thing does not. Okay, that could work. Hey, more of an ectoplasm type of thing. So let's break it up like that. No physical body versus a physical form. Physical body. So again, making our little choices. Okay, no physical body here. Versus physical body on this side. Great. Okay. Now we need to figure out how to break up Frankenstein's monster and Dracula. Well, one of the most obvious ways is by Dracula's got those crazy canines, right? He's got those elongated Dracula teeth. And uh, Frankenstein's monster does not, so let's do that. They got these really big teeth versus not. Again, always thinking about things that you can see even in dead specimens. Okay, so sharp canines, not sharp canines. Of course, in this case, we're assuming that the body of Dracula is gonna stay around after you kill him. Okay, so now we've got these all broken up. Okay, so now I am able to tell these fantastical creatures apart if I even had dead specimens. So this is exactly what we do with real life, honest to God specimens. People sit in a lab, they just look at these characteristics. They don't have to go online or look up what other people have done. And they're able to figure out exactly how to uh, key these things out if they have an unknown one. So now let's look at real things. So here is a group of six organisms that we're pretty familiar with, right? We can do this key with these six organisms. Okay, so make it a little more tangible here. So what are the major differences between these six organisms? First thing off the top of my head that I can think of is three of them have endoskeletons and three of them do not, right? So you got a horse, an eagle, and a lynx. They have skeletons inside. These other three do not. Okay, so we know that they're all animals. Now, if you think back, you know what the uh, definition of an animal is, right? Yeah, it's almost like we've done that on purpose. So let's see, I'm not gonna put the lines or anything in here. These have endoskeletons, these have no endoskeletons. Okay, now we've got this big old beetle with those huge femora, we've got some jellyfish, we've got a, uh, um, a dragonfly. How do we break those up? Well, two of those have exoskeletons while the jellyfish do not. Oh, all right, so let's do an exoskeleton versus no exoskeleton. Check. So I don't have to go look up a bunch of stuff here. I don't have to freak out and try to figure out exactly what these things are. I'm just looking at those physical, unchanging characteristics and trying to communicate that to other people. So exoskeleton, no exoskeleton. Now looking at these two insects here, what are two major things? Let's see, you've looked at a couple of insects. Well, yeah, this beetle has elytra, which are those hard coverings of the four wings, while the uh, dragonfly do not. Okay, great. Now, on to these endoskeleton having, having organisms. Got horse and a lynx and a bird. I mean, looking at those, you can ask any three-year-old how they're different. One has fur or hair, one has feathers. Okay, now, if you were talking to somebody who maybe wasn't... Uh, familiar with the difference between fur and feathers, you might have to uh, define that. But for the most part, people know. That's something that we learn in English pretty early. So we can just say that, hair versus feathers. Okay, now how are we gonna break up the lynx versus the horse? Hmm, let's see, let's look at their feet. Horses have those big, very tough hooves. Well, lynxes do not, they've got claws instead. Okay, that's a pretty good way. But we could look at all manner of things like maybe texture of fur, size, overall body form, musculature, but hooves are pretty easy to see and it's just sort of off the top of my head. Okay, so we got hooves on this side and we've got paws on the other side. Okay, so if I can remember how to spell hooves, <laughs> that would be great. Hey, and hooves. Wow, I am good today. Versus paws. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward, right? This is what we do with keys. 
All we do is we look at these physical and changing characteristics. So as you start going through your dichotomous keys, this is why I make you learn the external anatomy of these insects. So you've gone through and you're looking at this grasshopper. I want you to know where the femur are or the femora are, the compound eye, the antennae, because you are going to be looking at different insects that are going to have different forms of those external characteristics. And we've used these different forms to break up those insects into these dichotomous keys. All right. That's up for this ridiculous version of how to do a key. Up next, I'm going to be walking you through how to do a real key. Let me know if you have any questions.